I mean, the Green Deal is essentially the first step of our long-term strategy towards climate neutrality, net zero emissions by 2050. It's perhaps the most important part because it sets the scene and it starts the investment required, required for the transformation, which uh, uh, will last at least 30 years. And we're talking about transforming our society, transforming our economy, marrying zero emissions with competitiveness, with modernization, and with prosperity. And we intend to do that by changing energy system, going to uh, net zero uh, energy by 2050, to uh, changing our industry, almost net zero by 2050, uh, clean mobility, and a different use of the land. This is also a massive investment program uh, bearing in mind that uh, uh, maintaining the status quo uh, will be less expensive, but also expensive. So there's an important delta, but uh, um, uh, the figures that one hears have to be uh, read in context. I so said the Green Deal, this first part uh, with a target of 2030, uh, is a combination of uh, uh, targets for member states and the four measures that are embodied in the National Energy and Climate Plans, e-regulation on energy efficiency on uh, clean car or CO2 standards for cars, again, investment uh, through the uh, target in the Renewable Energy Directive, the funds like the Innovation Fund or the Modernization Fund that aims at helping uh, 10 member states to modernize the energy system um, and mainstreaming uh, climate into all the spending programs of, of the union and market instruments, uh, carbon pricing through either the emission trading system or taxation with the reform of the energy taxation directive. Today, we all pay for carbon. Um, the society as a whole is paying for carbon. These market instruments aim at making sure that those who emit more uh, pay more, so it's another uh, expression of the uh, polluter pay principle. Uh, put in these terms, what is there not to like with this objective? Of course, there are obstacles, and I would call three sets of obstacles. I mean, first of all, even though these are investments and not costs, you still need resources to find them, and today, resources are scarce. Um, and it's always easier even if you should invest in maintaining the status quo, to postpone investment in, in changing, modernizing something which is already there, which has been amortized, even if it would make sense to invest, it's always easier to postpone, whereas this is fresh investment that won't happen uh, if it is not made. Second set of obstacles, vested interests, the human resistance to change, and the fact that what makes sense for the society as a whole seen from the individual um, gives rise to the temptation to postpone, to do it later, to, um, uh, to wait. And third, the fact that we operate until today in a logic of a purely economic rationale where everything has to measure in terms of its contribution to economic growth and, uh, um, and, and creation of wealth, uh, with a fairly short-term uh, objective, uh, with a fairly short-term uh, view, uh, and therefore gives rise to the obvious question, can we afford to do all this? Can we afford to do it now? Uh, is it too much, uh, too fast? Um, in many ways, crises are disposing of these obstacles. The pandemic has disposed of many comfortable positions, many vested interests, and the change of attitude of uh, European government and European Union in looking for resources to restart our economy has also given us uh, the resources to trigger this transformation. Uh, the third set of obstacles, the purely economic rationale, is something which we are now putting in question again uh, because of the war in Ukraine and uh, looking again at perhaps there are things that must be done because they must be done. Uh, whether or not they make short-term economic sense. I shall stop here as an introduction. Thank you.
I heard uh, Mao very well. Uh, I will I will continue on on the lines that he he has set. Uh, the the question in substance uh, is: Can the Ukraine war be a signal of acceleration of the energy transition? This is the question. Can it be? Uh, I will answer in three parts. First, why it should be so. Second, what are the constraints? And finally, what is the avenue? What is the pathway? So first, why it should be. We are presently uh, trying to support Ukraine in the war um, triggered by Russia. However, we are paying 700 million euro per day to Russia to buy fossil fuels, especially gas. So we are financing most of Russian war effort. That's why, that's the first reason why we should use this crisis to accelerate our transition away from fossil fuels. But the second is, of course, the objective we have that we have set to ourselves with the Green Deal and with the Fit uh, for 55 package. To get by, by carbon neutrality by 2050 and to get to the aim of reducing our a carbon emission by 55% by 2030, there is an absolute need to get rid of fossil fuels as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. So these are the two main reasons why we should consider the Ukraine war as an occasion to seize, to accelerate the energy transition. Now, there, there are big constraints that we have to deal with. What are they? The first one is the high EU dependency on Russian gas. It was around 45% of our gas coming from Russia last year. And with big differences, it is 55% for Germany, 25% for France. So we have to get these two things in mind, a huge dependency and at the same time, a very asymmetric dependency. That's the first big constraint we have. The second one is the difficulty to replace gas. Gas is much more difficult to replace than coal or oil. There are infrastructures like pipelines, which, which cannot be built overnight. Or there is the possibility to import uh, LNG. However, in order to do so, we need installations also on the receiving end to transform back the uh, LNG into, into gas. So this is not something that can be done overnight either. So, and that's my third part. What is the avenue? What, what should we do? First point, avoid as much as possible recourse to, recourse to coal in order to replace gas. I know that it has been done in Germany, it is being done in Italy, this should be avoided as much as possible and limited to a very short period, as coal is three times as polluting as gas. So this should be really avoided. Second point, accelerate energy efficiency gains. It is possible to reduce temperatures. It is possible to reduce speed on the, on the highways. It is possible to cancel some uh, trips by car when you can just walk or take your, your bike. 
it is possible to isolate buildings uh, quicker than uh, it was uh, foreseen. So second point, accelerate energy efficiency gains. Third point, of course, accelerate renewable energy transitions, especially towards solar and wind. There are projects which are in the pipeline and which are almost ready uh, to, to see uh, the light of the day. We have for that to solve conflicts and we have to accelerate uh, technologies. I can enter into, into detail, but they are wonderful technologies uh, for, uh, for wind farms uh, in ocean that can at the same time uh, solve uh, conflicts of use. Um, now, fourth point, be united in our quest for alternative gas providers. The COVID crisis has shown once again that when we are together, when we show solidarity between member states, we are much stronger. And so this will be my, conclu my, my conclusion. Solidarity will be key in solving this crisis as quickly as possible and making of the Ukraine war an occasion to accelerate the energy transition. Thank you. Okay, um, I, got, I got the green signal to, to proceed. So um, it's unfortunate. I was thinking this, uh, this afternoon that it's too bad that I'm, I'm, I'm not in Berlin, <laughs> which would be a lot more fun. Um, that being said, um, thank you so much for the invite and thinking about the role of natural gas um, in, in, in the European uh, Union right now, um, it plays a major role, obviously, and that's one of the reasons that we're confronted with this massive challenge. Um, but thinking about uh, um, the problem is that it seems a little less hopeless than it did. Um, surprisingly, when I got into the sort of analysis of natural gas and its role um, was just after the uh, 2009 supply crisis. And, and the parallels are, are sort of uncanny in a lot of ways of, of how um, things are being sort of securitized um, as the um, event's title also shows. And what is, what is really uplifting in this sense that it still continues to play about uh, a quarter of, of European uh, Union's energy demand relies on natural gas, so that extent is still huge, but the comparisons and this general scope of action is so much wider and so much broader that that's what sort of gives me some optimism. Um, and it's something that would have had to be done anyway, right? So if we if we look and consider how the development uh, of, of discourses around uh, what role natural gas can play uh, in the mid to long term is, is that there was this gradual shift in the European Union towards uh, questioning its, its future. Um, in comparison to coal, this was a much more gradual and, and, and this, this discussion came a little bit later, um, but we see that there was some sort of response already after the 2009 crisis with some energy efficiency measures. But as we move past the sort of Paris Agreement and, and the clean, uh, clean Energy Package in 2016, um, there was an understanding that this would have to be sort of phased out. And one of the core sort of elements of that was that uh, deeper understanding of lifetime emissions and the, and the issue with met methane um, and, um, uh, and the methane leakage problem that, that is effectively unresolved. And the potency of, of methane leaking into the atmosphere is something that indeed drove commission policy and, and is something that is unaddressed and is one of the reasons I think that um, natural gas is much more problematic um, and, and why um, common and discourse in the, in, the energy, uh, in the energy spheres and the European Union sort of shifted and allowed it to move towards uh, questioning of that broader sort of transition fuel narrative that was very popular in the 2010s where you know, natural gas would help us transition or bridge the gap effectively from more polluting coal and oil products um, towards renewables. Um, so the question here is that, given that sort of disposition that we arrived into and, and the general understanding that it would have to be phased out, um, the war on Ukraine simply allows for the securitization of that and, and, and for, for a more 
visceral and a quicker response to that, um, which in itself is pretty good. If we consider that um, what methane emissions, uh, how they can exacerbate the, the problems of, of natural gas, given that effectively 2% um, uh, leakage rates already sort of put it on par with coal when we look at their lifetime assessment. And I think that's one of the um, one of the interesting factors that sort of came to develop over the last couple of years is how do we draw natural gas, but how do we increasingly limit the sort of lock in and the path dependencies that can be created as, as a couple of speakers before me already had mentioned um, is 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 how how do we limit that sort of role it plays, and I think one of the key elements was sort of including it, but including it in a, in a very cautious manner. And, and that one of the outlets for that was uh, relying increasingly and in considering how we can substitute natural gas or decarbonize it um, in the mid to long term with uh, biomethane partially and also by gradually shifting and adapting to a consumption of hydrogen. Um, here, I think it was a very interesting question and that was one of the sort of um, concerns that I think a lot of uh, myself included had was, what portion of that hydrogen would be natural gas based. Now that it's securitized, I think that disposition is fundamentally shifting and those, and those possibilities are, are increasingly shifting to how permissible is it to actually include natural gas based hydrogen, even if it's carbon free into the EU's energy system. And therefore um, it ultimately sort of pushes uh, EU policy towards increasingly more ambition, uh, political, technological, economic ambition to shift um, towards a solely renewable based energy system where gas could play a role, but that gas would also have to be based uh, solely on renewables. Um, I'll leave it at that and thank you. Every country in the EU, in terms of our security and uh, the risk that this involves, if we do not, if you're not able to deter Russia from doing this again and again and deter others, actually, in other world regions for doing similar things, I think there's a strong case to demonstrate that we, in terms of a community of having certain values, being able and willing to stand up and in, 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 uh, accept some losses, to defend these values, um, and I think we should be doing it. The question is, how should we do it? Um, so one comment on, on the embargo question. Um, so I leave out coal, it's not important for the Russian state um, budget or not so important, and we have a plan at the European level for, for getting rid of it, but it's about oil and gas. Um, we're discussing oil this week in particular. Now there's this concern that an oil embargo will withdraw about 12% of world oil uh, market supply from Russia it will not be everything. Others will, of course, continue buying oil, and this will drive up prices. And this has bad repercussions for developing countries, etc. Now, there's a way to go around this, and with, this is uh, either fixing a certain price or setting a tariff on oil imports from Russia. And I think this would be a pretty smart way of going about doing this. Um, the question is, if Russia would then stop delivering oil, I don't think so, because they have pressure to actually continue producing it to not damage their wells, etc. Uh, this would limit the um, income to the Russian state, which is our main target here in terms of sanctioning. And, and intertemporally, over time, it will at least hamper the ability of the Russian state to, to, to wage war and to, to um, 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 continue uh, this regime. Of course, we have no guarantee at all that the regime will collapse as a reaction to that. Empirical research on sanctions doesn't tell us that this is always uh, successful. But nonetheless, we can, we can increase the pressure and we should. Um, and um, the instrument of tariffs or fixing prices, both for oil and for gas, I should also say, um, would be um, a, a smarter approach than a full embargo um, from, from a variety of perspectives, including from the damage it does to the European Union economy and, and to the world economy, because we still have the inflow of gas and then we can do our phase out over the next years and as quickly as possible, while at the same time um, damaging Russian state finances, whichever we want to do here. Yeah. And we have a bargaining chip in negotiations with Russia, or the Ukraine actually has these, this bargaining chip, um, because you can raise or lower sanctions, right, as, a, in, as part of potential negotiations one day. Um, other than that, I think in, we should get our act together now in Germany, in Europe, on, on reducing gas consumption. I think we're not there at all. It feels like sleepwalking to me. We're not in a war mode here in saving energy at all. And this really needs to be ramped up quickly at the level of political rhetoric, at the level of measures, I don't know, bonus payments for energy savings, whatever. But we need to be a bit more creative and a bit more agile here in terms of, of pushing this forward and this it's not a great message to, do, to deliver as a policymaker, I can get that, but we should really become 
much more serious about this. Also, I would be happy to keep the markets working where possible high prices reduce um, consumption. We should support the poor to deal with a fallout, but we should not damage our European energy markets. We really need them also for the green transition, actually. We need the flexibility and the cost savings. Um, and a final point, um, on, because coal and LNG were mentioned. So I'm not concerned about increasing coal use now, actually. I would argue for we should turn on German coal power plants and nuclear power plants if we can actually and just switch off these gas power plants to save every cubic meter of gas that we can and put it in, into the storage sites right now because there is the risk of blackmail the next winter is coming and we need full storage sites do not be uh, subject to blackmail to to put in by then i think that's that's absolutely essential and at least short term i would prioritize that in the bigger scheme of things even if it's terrible from a climate perspective and i would even be fine with building LNG terminals to get the security flexibility to be able to switch away from Russian gas, even if we don't use them. Ideally, we would never use them. We would use state funds. In my view, we could use those state funds because there's the security um, um, element to it that firms don't have an incentive to invest in. But as a state, we do have this investment incentive. Um, and I think there's a strong rationale for doing it. Thank you. Um, your excellent analysis and for a few um, extremely political statements. I do hope um, everyone in the room and uh, in the online audience is busy tweeting things like we need to be on a war mode when it comes to energy savings, um, but we also need to compensate uh, poorer households uh, if we're changing our approach um, to energy security. Thank you so much um, for this. Jesse, is there anything that you want to add? I do see that uh, the questions on Menti uh, keep coming in. There are quite a few on Central Eastern European um, EU member states. I would leave that um, for John. Um, maybe, Jesse, for whatever gap you're now going to fill in debate, I give this one question to you. Would meaningful increases of taxes on Russian energy imports be a viable alternative to embargoing fossils? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure um, how we can simply increase taxes on Russian energy imports. Let's start with the big point. Should we have an embargo? Um, the argument for an embargo is that we should not be financing this war. The argument that makes that embargo difficult is we don't know how cold it's going to be winter 2022-23. We cannot replace much gas supply by then. and We certainly can't reduce. Reducing is much more important. I'm coming to that. Not by next winter. And we do not know how cold it's going to be. Now, we can burn coal to generate electricity. And in some systems, we can even burn it to generate heat. But the big swing factor for gas, and it's 30 BCM, we import around 150 BCM average from Russia per year, there is a 30 BCM swing, depending on how cold the winter is, how much we're using to heat buildings. So there is, I want to see an embargo, but let's be clear, there is a worst case scenario where we have a total embargo and then a very cold winter, and then we have to back down. That, of course, would be an appalling signal to Putin. So there's a reason people are having a careful, detailed, quantitative debate here. Now, if we can get through next winter, then we're in the sort of 12 to 36 month space where we can really start to do some structural things to reduce gas consumption. That's what we need to do. Several people have said already, we need under the EU Green Deal, the climate neutral target, the net zero target, pretty much to do the things we're now talking about doing. We were already committed to renewables, wind, solar, geothermal for heat, and to energy efficiency, of which the big bit is insulating buildings so that you use less heat. We were already committed to those. We need to deliver them. We have strong targets from Brussels. The problem is that implementing them is for the member states. And we know what the big barrier is to implementing building wind farms for the moment. It's the permitting process. It's the rules around land and permitting which are national, which are too slow, which were designed in a different era, which have inadequate bureaucracies behind them. And we know what the big challenge is here for buildings. Essentially, we are interfering in properties and they're pretty varied and they have historic differences and it's going to cost a lot and pay back slowly. These are things we've known for years. 
but we've not been very good at directing political effort to the answers on the scale we need to, frankly. That's what I understand by the concept of securitizing. You know, I'm seeing Ukrainian flags all over Berlin, fantastic. I'm seeing some people saying, ban Russian fossil fuels, fantastic. I'd like to see a third panel to those banners saying, build onshore wind, build PV. I'm not seeing any of that. Will we find that because the war links energy issues to the climate agenda, will we find that suddenly defense ministers become interested in the Green Deal, become interested in climate neutrality? That's for me what securitization means. Defense ministers are senior ministers in most governments. So far, the Green Deal has been kind of owned by some members of governments. Hopefully now, heads of government, defense ministers see their own interest in that outcome. And I wouldn't want to switch on the coal. Um, why not? Well, the global signal. Um, and when I first saw the news of the war, virtually the first set of phone calls I had were with climate scientists. Thinking at global scale, I'm afraid we are out to lose something like half a decade on reducing emissions. Because if you are sitting in an emerging economy today, food prices have gone crazy. Cost of money has gone crazy. Oil prices have gone crazy. One of the few things you control is if you have a domestic coal supply, is that it's made it very difficult to talk about the coal transition in emerging economies. And if we switch back to coal out of European self-interest, which is how it will be perceived from the rest of the world. So I think we need to be really brave and really have some difficult two, three years ahead of us. And it's wind, it's solar, it's geothermal, it's insulation. Let's keep focusing on that. It's fascinating to discuss oil and gas, but actually they're the big things, the things that matter. that in this room and in the online audience there are lots of um, young people really waiting to uh, be working on these issues but there are lots and lots of things we need to do now and i'm sure um genevieve um, you're itching to come in i'm sure you've been taking notes um so yeah over to you Yes, I am pleased to intervene, but uh, unfortunately, you should repeat the questions as uh, you know that uh, due to technical issues, we missed most of the conversation. So could you could you please tell me uh, on what I am supposed to speak? <laughs> um, Jesse just ended on a very interesting note on how European defense ministers and head of state, heads of state should be jumping on the decarbonization agenda, on the renewables agenda for security reasons. So maybe you can elaborate on uh, what opportunities you see on that front. You might also want to make a few comments on, and let me pick and choose from the questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, this is about, yeah, maybe you can elaborate as well on the impacts of potential EU sanctions on um, gas supplies from Russia. And maybe you can comment as well on the extent to which EU member states can refuse to pay for Russian gas and oil in ruble. Okay. Uh, so first of all, um on on the question of renewables um what jesse has said is really echoing what what i said before and as well as uh, as Mauro. we have uh, we have a huge potential with uh, renewables and this war must be an occasion to accelerate uh, the shift toward renewables but even more than that towards the, I would say, the, the, the golden solution. The golden solution is energy efficiency. And, and there are a lot of possibilities to accelerate energy efficiency gains. You may have seen that in Italy, for instance, they are not only uh, going around everywhere, Mr. Draghi is going around everywhere to find uh, new sources 
of uh, gas supplies. He is also taking very reasonable measures like setting uh, the, the temperature limit, uh, you know, for, um, for, for this summer uh, in Italy to 25 degrees. And, you know, it's not necessary to go lower than 25 degrees to feel, uh, to feel perfectly well. Um, so this is one, one example, but we can also envisage next winter with temperature which are one degree less than usual. So all of these, if you put all of these together, you will see that we have huge possibilities to get rid as quickly as possible uh, of uh, Russian gas. The other, the other uh, possibilities concern the way we uh, travel. There are a lot of short trips that we can do uh, without a car. We can walk, we can take our bike. And also, if we reduce speeds on roads and highways, we will gain uh, a lot in energy efficiency and be able to get rid of gas uh, sooner. In the case of Germany, for instance, uh, at a certain moment, Germany did not foresee to be able to get out from its dependency from Russian gas before 2024. And now the possibility is uh, affirmed for the end of the year. So there are technological solutions that are applied, like the leasing of floating platforms for the storage and transformation of LNG. I was speaking also coming back to renewables, I was speaking of technological solutions that will reduce the conflicts of use. Uh, as far as wind farms are concerned, fishermen are afraid of the consequences of wind farms on marine life and their ability to fish around. And there are now new concept of wind farm pillars that are able to attract marine life and that are uh, positive uh, for uh, fishermen as uh, marine life will be thriving uh, around these, uh, these new uh, farms. So you know what, confronted to a crisis, we are just accelerating, we should at least, but I think it is happening in a certain manner. We should accelerate our shift to uh, more uh, virtuous behaviors like energy efficiency, like renewables and technologies also that help us uh, get rid of uh, of uh, Russian Russian uh, gas, so I am I I am um, among the persons who are who are rather on the optimist side. I think we can manage to get rid of this dependency before the end of the year, and we see such an acceleration in all these domains that uh, make, make me feel optimistic. I think also that um, uh, the public is putting pressure uh, on public authorities because they wish uh, to show solidarity towards uh, Ukrainians and to stop, uh, to stop financing uh, the Russian war effort. Very much, Genevieve, for your note of optimism. Thank you for reminding us that uh, there is so much we ourselves can actually do. And thank you also for um, 
mentioning two of the pain points in the German debate in particular, I, a speed limit on German motorways, which we are really struggling with for some reason, but also Germany's um, really unacceptable import dependency on Russian gas. Let's move our focus um, again to EU member states uh, east to Germany in Central Eastern Europe, and perhaps also on candidates in the Western Balkans. John, this is really um, your topic of research, and you wanted to come back um, to this. I want to give you two questions uh, that were raised in the audience. Uh, first of all, should the EU let CEE member states off the hook when it comes to climate policy? Is it really too much to ask from them to decarbonize the economies that quickly? That's the first question. And the second one that the audience submitted is about Bulgaria and Poland. Can you comment on the situation there now that Russia decided uh, to end its gas exports to these um, two member states? Over to you, John. Thank you. Um... Uh, those are really excellent questions. Uh, maybe just feeding off of what uh, Genevieve had, had sort of begun, the, the key point and the key addition that I would add to that is that when we consider Germany's reduction in, in imports and the severing of its import reliance on Russian natural gas, it has to be done with close coordination with other member states. And I think this is where the sort of Eastern European perspective comes in as very important, um, given that if there's this Western European push to reduce the reliance, that doesn't always necessarily reflect the sort of political complexities and intertwinement of what were former um, you know, Comic-Con states and, and and the difficulties that they may face in that. Not only that, but also given the sort of access that these countries have to alternative import source, sources, because Germany may be able to pay for that additional LNG. But then if we look at what Hungary or Bulgaria or Poland, or even going to uh, deeper into the Western Balkans, whether they may be able to pay for those imported uh, LNG uh, resources on a tight market is highly debatable, given the sort of differences in terms of GDP per capita income if we just look at it very crudely. Um, so, so I think that's definitely an element that, that where the European Union and, and the Commission's role come in, comes in as very important in coordinating those. Um, when we consider um, letting, letting uh, Eastern European sits off the hook, definitely not, right? I think this current situation just underscores um, the, the fact that having such relatively lax um, commitments, which were clearly visible in their 2020, um, their 2020 uh, targets, which were um, pretty, pretty uh, well, they weren't that difficult. They weren't too ambitious. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, and then if we consider um, how much resistance there is from these countries um, to 2030 or EU fit their 55 goals is, is also a whole other question. Um, but in a lot of cases, sort of money and subsidies will probably solve a lot of the problems and, and, and will bring them on board, hopefully. So I think that's, that's really important, but definitely shouldn't be um, let off the hook, especially given that when we look at the relative terms of, of uh, for instance, Russian hydrocarbon reliance or Russian uh, reliance on Russian technologies, it becomes more um, uh, crucial, in addition to which we have the air pollution problem. So I think that should also not be looked at uh, as independently if we... Um, you know, uh, Poland was brought up, um, given the air pollution issues in Warsaw, then we can bring those two together and, and sort of intertwine that with uh, securitization in order to make some sort of meaningful progress, progress hopefully. Uh, when we consider Bulgaria and, uh, and Poland, um, the two cases I think are very different, um, given on my knowledge of the matter, and I'm by no means am I claiming to, uh, to know very, very deeply about these countries. Um, from a macro sort of uh, macroscopic standpoint, what, what I came to understand about these countries is that Poland had already had a strategic ambition to reduce its reliance on Russian natural gas. So there, what we're seeing is an acceleration of already ongoing tendencies with the LNG import terminal, with the rising reliance on Norwegian pipeline imports. Um, there's a general shift there. I think that's pretty important. What Poland, I think, will really carefully need to consider is whether it can use natural gas as this transition fuel from its very um, deep reliance on coal 
um, towards renewables and for how long, given that we're probably going to be looking at a high natural gas price environment for the forthcoming uh, years. Um, so that's just definitely a macroeconomic risk that the country has. When we consider Bulgaria, I think the commitment was very audacious to reduce reliance on, uh, on Russian imports and there are alternatives to substitute. There, there too, I think the price element comes in as very important and also figuring out how you are going to be able to solve the, 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 the challenge in that Bulgaria relies on natural gas to a pretty small extent but it plays a very important role in district heating, how those homes are able to substitute that sort of energy, um, that heat production is a key question, because if you have everybody sort of running for electric heaters next winter, that's not going to be good for the overall grid in the region and then may ultimately lead to a number of issues. So that sort of coordination is, is essential at this point in time. Thank you. Much John for um, addressing all these questions in such an excellent and succinct manner. There is someone in the audience who's uh, really itching to know about the possibilities of actually implementing some of the infrastructure challenges because we don't have enough technical workers, um, that's the claim in the question, to do all the um, retrofitting for instance and to rebuild our energy systems. So I give this to the panel, maybe for later round, um, but definitely also um, to Mauro Petriccione. I invite you, Mauro, to conclude this um, panel, panel to panel discussion um, by filling some of the gaps before I then hand over to the audience for questions and comments. Mauro, over to you. Thank you very much. Look, a bit difficult to conclude a, uh, a discussion of which you missed the good 40%. But uh, from, um, from what I heard, look, I, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to try to do justice to, um, uh, to everything. But uh, let me try and jumble together a number of considerations concerning um, energy, the energy, the transition, and, and, and the security angle. I mean, first of all, uh, we, we mustn't forget that uh, fossil fuels have had uh, one big advantage and one big disadvantage. And that's shaping very much the problem we have today. The big advantage is they are extremely simple to use. Everything we can do to replace them is going to be more complicated. And therefore, by definition, it's going to be criticized more. We will not achieve the simplicity of the use of uh, of fossil fuels that we have achieved. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the enthusiasm when I was a youngster about nuclear power. Nuclear power was the thing that was going to be even simpler than fossil fuels. Well, it has turned out to be a bit more complicated than that. The big disadvantage is that by and large, not always, but by and large, fossil fuels have concentrated well, concentrated power and bred corruption. Uh, and that corruption has been a key element in strengthening dictatorships across the world. Uh, and Russia is a big example of that. Russia is a profoundly corrupt, corrupt system. Uh, and uh, that corruption has bred a lack of democracy. Now, if you, if you look at this, we mustn't forget that we're talking about a transition. We tend, when we talk transition, in reality, most of us talk about switch, as if you could do things overnight. We now have a major energy crisis compounded by a war. All our plans did not foresee a massive change in the use of uh, fossil fuels towards renewable for at least four or five years, perhaps longer, if you look at the figures for 2030. Um, now, we've talked a lot about uh, locking uh, new energy infrastructure, stranded assets. That is absolutely true. It's a danger. It's a risk. Uh, at the same time, we have a short-term problem, next winter's problem, an 18-month problem in which uh, we are in war and we will do things which uh, we shouldn't have done otherwise. The question is, where do we put the limit? One thing is to burn more coal now. 
Another thing is to restart coal plants which have been put out of commission. Um, the investment required there is a huge stranded asset. Yes, Jess is right that worldwide, uh, we have a huge risk that in a number of economies, especially emerging economies, all this consideration will be ignored in favor of the short term need to find energy as cheap as possible. But if we don't give the rational example of Europe, things can only get worse out everywhere. And the rational example is not, not burn coal today at all costs, is to avoid that this becomes in, an intolerable degree of restarting a process, a process which we were on, 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 on the way to stopping. Some uh, stranded assets in energy infrastructure, perhaps. How much? For how long? How much of that infrastructure is recyclable? Because part of the infrastructure will be recyclable for uh, products like green hydrogen or green ammonia. Uh, the important thing is that to be clear now, where are we going? This is going to have an impact on our transition. Does not to have, have an impact on our targets. It may alter the shape of the first part of that transition. It does not necessarily alter the entire trajectory. Um, we are singularly bad as human beings as looking at things in this uh, short, medium, long-term perspective in a rational way. But this is a matter of uh, literally life and death. Um, you know, climate change is not an efficient destructor. Uh, it does not destruct very quickly, but it is a very effective destructor. Uh, and in the long term, um, it will produce as much damage as a war. So we need to get into this mentality that transition has a beginning. Uh, I, I, I noted down, I was tempted to uh, joke about the you know, Energie über alles uh, in Germany, but my own country is pretty much the same, uh, it's pretty much the same problem and pretty much the same reaction. Um, but we need to pump up our ability to replace fossil with renewables. We need to first of all face the issue that we are not an island and we will not produce all the energy we need ever, but that there is a difference between importing green power from a variety of countries, most of whom would be our allies and importing fossil power from a few sources, most of whom are not particularly friendly to us. Um, and, uh, uh, we also need to look at the complexity of the system that we are going to. We have a very short term agenda, uh, which is replacement of Russia fossils. Uh, but we already have a short to medium term agenda, which is replacement by fossil or fossil fuels of Russian origin primarily with renewables and with hydrogen. And we have a much greater willingness to find the investment uh, required. Now, uh, for me, one element which is going to make that possible, uh, and then I would like to rejoin uh, Genevieve in her optimism, which is not surprising, we've been optimists together for a very long time. Um, we are really changing the way we look at things. A war gives the message there are things that you do because you have to, because your survival is dependent on that. For the past few decades, we have measured everything with the meter of, with the metric of short term um, economic advantage. Well, you know, wars are not economic advantageous ever. Uh, wars are bad, are about business, whichever you look at that, but sometimes you wage war because you have to. Um, climate change is good business, you know, climate policy is good business in the long term. There are questions of whether they're good business in the short term, um, but the only way to do this is do them because you have to. Uh, and I think this change of mood uh, is, is going to help us put us on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the right trajectory. And um, I'll stop here. Let me just answer the question that you threw around on uh, buildings and the skills. That is a very valid point. 
that re, you know, remedying a lack of skills isn't rocket science. We don't need to go somewhere and dig those skills in the ground. We can teach them. We can train people. Uh, we can uh, improve the quality of our workforce, and it's not very complicated. The money is there. The ability is there. The question is, do we have the will to do it, and therefore, do we get organized to do it? Right. Thank you so much, Mahu. Thank you for ending on a note of optimism as well. I would now like to bring in the audience. It's now your opportunity to ask live questions. I haven't been able yet to bring in all of the questions you posted via Menti and uh, post them to the uh, panelists. So I would like to ask the uh, the present uh, the, the the audience here in the room to simply show your hands if you wish to ask a question and the civica team will monitor mentee to make sure we're not missing out on any questions any questions or comments here from the floor that is you to ask questions that's new <laughs> So I can only say over there, you all look almost the same to me because some of you, you've got um, <laughs> black face masks, others have um, white face masks. <laughs> yes, please. My name is Anna Kraut. I'm a former Hurdy student. Oh, that's Anna. Um, and nice to see you all. Thank you all for your comments. Um, I'd like to, you tried, you asked one of my questions, Sabrina, and I'd love to flip it on its head a little bit and get the panelists information. Um, Eastern European states are the most vulnerable to this war, and they're also the ones that face the biggest uphill battle in terms of perpetuating their green transitions. Is this an opportunity to actually uh, reorient EU climate policy towards these member states and focus on the Eastern states more instead of the Western states, given that that lock-in potential and the infrastructure constraints there are, are really going to be a challenge even more so going forward. Thanks so much. Thank you for this excellent question, Emma. You really put the logic of a, um, an earlier question on its head and reversed the logic. Um, let's take uh, two or three questions uh, in a row. Are there any more here in the room? Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Anastasia, I'm from Ukraine, and um, actually I wanted to ask um, why, and I'm asking this question uh, a lot, actually while I'm in Berlin here, uh, why Germany and the EU, with all of their um, ambitions regarding uh, green development, was uh, so dependent on such a toxic uh, supplier, especially of the gas, is Russia. And um, well, in Ukraine, we um, had observed uh, a lot of uh, issues with the supply of gas, for example, and every heating season, that was a problem. And uh, Russia was causing uh, a lot of problems, uh, which influenced the uh, energy markets, especially in uh, Europe. That's why I'm asking uh, why it happened like this, and why, for example, we see these uh, huge shares of uh, imported gas in Germany as like 55%. Thank you, Anastasia. It's a great question because obviously we've all been aware of the issue, but uh, politically um, it wasn't addressed. Now we've got one more question here um, on the left uh, in the front, left from uh, my perspective. With the flowery shirt, yeah. You can, you can take off the mask when you speak, of course. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the uh, distributive impacts as well. And um, I know in some countries, for example, the Netherlands, the, in response to the rising um, gas prices, they've suspended some of the consumption charges and taxes. 
Um, and what is a good way to, I mean, in this way, they avoid um, the price signal that could lead people to drive their cars less. So what is a way to address these distributive impacts, um, but at the same time, keep the potential for these price signals in place? Great question on the, the market economy aspects um, of the situation we're in. I'm just briefly checking the Menti once more, whether there's anything that has been liked by many of you and that we, we should still bring in. I think we've asked the most important questions. Is there still anything coming from the floor in this room? Then I would yeah, like to take a last question before handing over to the panel. Lady in the wonderful robe here in the first row. Thank you. My name is Eleanor. I'm a final year at Hurdy. Um, I was interested to hear about the potential for diversion of gas supply from Russia and the um, opportunities and restraints for Russia to reroute some of its gas supplies towards China and other interested buyers. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. It's now time for a last and concluding round on the panel. Is there anyone who would really like to go first? Jesse is looking at me in that particular way. Over to you. Well, they were very tempting questions, I must admit. One of them I'm going to duck. The one on um, prices and the price signal and how to protect the vulnerable bots and the right signal, I think, I suspect Christian has a view on that. I certainly know it's been a lot debated in Brussels. But on the three gas questions, which sort of relate to one another. First, why do we have such dependency? Well, um, some of it's been a historic choice to use a resource that's near Europe and to not think about the dependency implications. And some countries have for years said there's a dependency risk and others have said for years, yes, but there are lots of interdependencies that make this actually low risk. I think the guys who said there was a dependency risk turned out to be right. Also, some things have changed. We used to produce quite a lot of gas in Europe from the Groningen field in the Netherlands. That is now shrinking down because essentially so much pressure had been removed from the field it was causing earthquakes. So we have had less domestic supply in Europe. We've had to import more. Meanwhile, a lot of the pipelines were built in an era before LNG existed. LNG is still a relatively recent phenomenon. So some of this goes back decades. Some of it was an attempt to build an Ostpolitik. Some of it has been affected by recent factors and different countries took different approaches. Why? Well, in the end, you don't buy gas because you don't have a use for it. It's what the uses are. Decisions to have housing stock, which heats with gas, heavy industry, which uses gas as its feedstock or for heat. Decisions to build the power sector with or without nuclear. One of the reasons there's a lot less gas in France, there's a nuclear fleet. Then the question of um, the ability to divert supplies, what Russia can do if we use less. Well, there are pipelines now between Russia and China. The Pride of Siberia pipeline won. There were negotiations for two. There's extension deeper further into southern China. But the fields that are on the European side of Russia are an incredibly long way you know, much more than the width of Europe, incredibly long way from the opportunities for pipelines that are on the Chinese board, even though that's a very, very long border. So a lot of it's going to be about LNG. And one of the big questions is there are two major new LNG supplies coming online in the mid 2020s in the world, there's Qatar going to increase. And it was intended that the Yamal Peninsula in Siberia one of the big questions now is whether actually through sanctions, the Russians will not be able to access the technologies to build out Yamal as they'd intended to. If they do build it out, then there's going to be a lot of Russian LNG in the world looking for a market, and we'll have to have discussions about who's willing to buy that and who isn't, but they may not be able to create that increased supply. They can't just divert what's flowing through the pipelines from Europe to anywhere else. There's a lot of technical steps. Last one here was on the Eastern European member states. Um, yes, I mean, there's always been an opportunity to say that the carbon intensity of the Eastern member states is greater 
than many of the Western member states. And there's been an enormous effort in the EU Green Deal, and I'm sure Mauro can speak to this, to shift resources that can support transition in Eastern member states. It's not the first time, but it's on a different scale now with the EU Green Deal. That said, I worked with the Polish government back in 2011 and listened very closely to their arguments against EU climate policy in favor of Polish coal. And really what they boiled down to was we own the coal, it's state owned, it's a champion industry, we will defend it, and by the way, we don't have a wind turbine manufacturer. If we had a Polish wind turbine manufacturer with Polish flags on it, we'd be building a lot of them, but we're not so keen on buying them from Siemens and Vestas and other countries. So you need to build up not just policies that help transition, but industries, opportunities, a sense that there is a green economic model around technology and jobs for those member states, as well as simply a kind of compensation package. That's not actually persuasive enough by itself. Great, thank you so much. I understand, I understand that two of our speakers will have to leave soon. I'm handing over to Mauro and then Genevieve in that order. The next one will then be John and I'll have Christian to uh, finish off this round, Mauro. Many thanks, uh, Sabrina, and apologies for, for having to leave you. Just very quickly, uh, East versus West. Uh, yes, it is true. Uh, our, most of our Eastern member states have a bigger legacy of an inefficient energy system that needs to be fixed. Uh, but let's not fall into uh, the trap of big categories. Uh, as usual, many of these transformations work better if you have the will to do it and uh, if you have the, uh, uh, the human resources and the organization to do it. Uh, if you look at countries like Slovakia or Czechia, the transformation is going rather well. They're going to come out of coal fairly fast uh, and they've been uh, building alternatives faster than others. Um, uh, Poland, if you look at the policy, the, the, as to follow up on what just said, if you look at the policies that the Polish government has been following for the past three years, very different from uh, those of the previous 10 years. Uh, and now Poland is doing what Germany has been doing uh, with renewables, uh, wind, uh, and at the end of the day, um, coal uh, plays still an important role, but it's not as fundamental as, as it used to be in, uh, uh, in Poland. Um, Hungary does not have a climate issue, but Hungary has chosen to go nuclear. So the, you know, if you look at then, uh, uh, Romania and, and Bulgaria, you see the impact of the weakness of the administration in those countries, which is a well-known problem, and it's a, a more widespread problem than the, the energy system. So, Again, to, to complete what we just said, this is not just a matter of uh, compensation package. You know, can you please build a few more turbines uh, and uh, stop burning coal? Uh, you, you, you need a, um, a, this has to be part of an economic development strategy. You know, miners today are no longer people with a pickaxe. Miners are engineers, are technicians. You can recycle miner, miners. What do you recycle them towards? That's the real issue. Um, on uh, why we were so dependent on Russia, well, because the Russians were very, you know, were very cheap and very reliable. And we fell for it. There's no other reason and no excuse. Uh, this is an explanation, not a justification. Um, and uh, yes, those who said that this was dangerous uh, uh, ended up being right. Last point on the distributive impact. Um, the, we've tried to give quite a lot of guidance to member states on what could be done, especially using wind for profit from, uh, from emission, emission trading to lighten the, the, the burden on people. But you, you read, you're absolutely right that lowering the burden of the carbon price or the energy price on everybody means losing the price signal and means damaging our prospect for, for a transition. Most of us can afford uh, to pay higher prices. 
And to be honest, we've paid ridiculously low energy prices for far too long. Um, and that's part of the problem. Some people can't afford uh, to pay the bills, and that has not been created by the current crisis, has not been created by carbon pricing. Uh, it has been exacerbated, and they need help. But car, you know, suspension of, uh, of taxes, suspending you know, financial help has to be very, very targeted. We have to get into our mind that in an affluent society, if you want to emit, you have to pay for it. And the bigger the price, the better off we all are as a collectivity. And uh, we have to, uh, uh, we pay for our luxuries. This is a luxury uh, that we should, uh, we should not be able to afford, but you know, if we're still able to afford it, we should pay for it. Thank you very much, Mauro. Thank you for being so generous with your knowledge and especially with your time this afternoon. And thank you also for ending your comments with a bit of a wake up call um, for all of us. We understand that you need to leave now. Um, thanks so much for being with us. Um, Genevieve, I'm handing thank, over. To thank, thank you for, uh, for the invitation. This was an extremely interesting conversation. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Nice to see you. Um, so I will continue. Uh, I, I, I just I I would like to react first on on the question of why uh, this dependency uh, in Germany, and uh, I I must say that I asked the question to myself, and I see two legacies. Uh, the first one is the decision that was taken to go out of uh, nuclear energy um, and to do it uh, in parallel with uh, trying to go out uh, from coal. So it leaves, it leaves a big room for, for gas. But this is one of the legacies. The, the other one is very physical. Uh, it's the fact that there were infrastructures uh, coming from Russia to uh, East Germany, former East Germany, and which are still in use. So I see, I see these two legacies to explain dependency, high dependency on gas, and especially on Russian gas. And this comes in addition to what uh, Mauro has recalled, the fact that Russian gas uh, was very cheap. Now, as far as the price signal is concerned, we should have a price signal to orient consumption uh, away from uh, fossil fuels. And what has to be said is that not only for the time being, this uh, uh, price signal is not there, but uh, EU, uh, EU fiscal system is made in such a way, look at the energy taxation, that actually fossil fuels are favored uh, compared to renewable energy. So this is something that has to be corrected. And this is part of the fit for 55 package. However, as Mauro has very rightly said, we have to take into account uh, the, uh, the most modest households who cannot afford it. So I think that beyond uh, this crisis, beyond the effect of this war, we should uh, have in mind that we should revert to a correct set of price signals while making a special case for uh, the people in need. That's it for me. Thank you very much. So much, uh, Genevieve. Um, again, thank you for being so generous um, with your time and uh, with your knowledge. Um, I'm sure it's uh, greatly appreciated in this audience. What I also do know is that Christian uh, wants to come back to some of the things you said. At least that's uh, what I could read from his reactions while you were speaking. But first of all, um, over to you, John. Maybe, maybe to speak to the points on on social policy and uh, uh, or the social 
policy element of, of energy consumption and, and, and the Eastern European case, it's really difficult to, um, to, to argue against the sort of distortion of the price signals, whereas in Eastern Europe, this has systematically been the case, right? So if we consider the legacy of pricing and the way that government has been structured effectively going back to communist times, then you had a very strong paternal state that effectively continuously subsidized energy prices. And this still is a continuous element of, of if we just consider, for instance, Hungary's recent um, re-election of, of, of the current government, um, it was, it continues to be a linchpin of politics, whereby you got to keep prices low and subsidize them and figure out how the math goes from there on. And it, it makes it very challenging to introduce any sort of energy efficiency matters um, while it strains the budget, right? We saw the difficulties that this leads to and not just Hungary, but consider North Macedonia, not an EU state, but had to turn to uh, the EBRD for a loan in order to sort of finance its waste. So sort of coming out of that status quo and sh shifting away from that is what's, what, what's increasingly difficult. And I do think that the current situation offers uh, an opportunity to shift away from Russian hydrocarbons, but simultaneously where this shift is heading is what we um, and, and policymakers in general need to be increasingly attentive of is um, what role do we allow for coal in this case, right? And in the case of the Western Balkans, there's been a clear response of going back to what we know best. And that's the reliance on the secure domestically produced coal, even if that isn't as cheap as it was once upon a time. Um, but sort of addressing it that in that sort of complexity and, and, and the EU just looking at it systematically and including um, the general region around itself, not only its member states, will help unleash those sort of interlinkages and those synergies um, between the countries that allow for this sort of very complex and challenging situation to, um, to be resolved. Thank you, John. And uh, we clearly need to come back to most of these questions um, in a few weeks or months' time. Christian. Little time, many questions. I try to ask three of them. Why is Germany so dependent on Russian energy? Well, that would fill an event in its own, I guess. Um, well, first, Russian gas was cheap. And for the German industry business model, cheap energy is a factor in international competition. So that was essential. Um, then there was obviously a related rush of uh, interest groups um, from business, but also from within parties. Then, of course, there's a network around Gerhard Schröder. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward as an old man to read inquiries into the Kremlin archives, to be honest, and to see what's, what's in there. Um, I don't know, but it's just um, making you wonder. Um, and finally, I think, why could this all happen? been also doing a bit of soul searching here because obviously there was a failure of the energy community in my view in, in this topic we've we've always we've as a climate community energy community pushed back against Nord Stream 2 I, I don't know anyone who would have said this is a great idea because we don't need it but there's a Russian cons uh, the Ukrainian concern it's been around all the time even with Nord Stream 1 it's been around all the time we knew it but we weren't very emotional about it we didn't push very hard about it and I think there's a lack of strategic culture in Germany when it comes to security issues, to foresight, and then to assessing these risks, and then to acting upon them. Um, it's a bit similar in climate, but um, I think this is the case, and we need to get better and ask ourselves, where's the next strategic challenge? Is it China? Is it other challenges that we may not see today? So I think this is the task, um, or the lesson I learned from this. Second, um, good compensation schemes. Well, ideally, you want to have high prices and then compensate the vulnerable, right? So these are people who are poor and who are highly affected by these prices. I did an analysis with colleagues at the MCC here in Berlin about the expected impacts on, on German population of energy price rises. In the current price scenario that we see, we have like the poorest income decile, so the 10% of the poorest population, um, energy price increases of 15 to 20% of the yearly income, which is just gone for increased energy payments. And politically, I mean, this is huge. This is going to be a huge issue. And it's not here yet. So I received my new energy, my new gas bill. It's now 350 euros instead of 100. Totally fine for me. Many people are not seeing it yet. And, and we really need to act proactive now on this and, and also expand these support packages, focusing on the very poorest. The richer 50% just don't need compensation. They should pay for it um, normatively, and I think also politically. Finally, um, possibilities to diversify away from gas supply for and for the EU on the one hand and on Russia, Elinor's question. 
I'm not an expert on this. I'm re only reading the stuff that you can read as well. Um, the analysis that the trade routes for Russia to Asia are on the short term, um, hard to substitute. Um, there's a lack of pipelines to Asia. So they will have challenges in exporting their um, oil and gas in the short term. There's already this discount of prices. Um, so I think Russia is indeed vulnerable on this end. Um, there will be some substitution. But again, if you do this smartly, using tariffs, cooperating with other partners internationally, I think this is going to be a big energy conversation. Um, if, you, if the EU goes for this, the US is basically already doing it right. I think things can be done. Um, and, and as I said before, in my view, strategically and normatively should be done. I want to, act, want to end on a, on a note of, of optimism. So to me, quite honestly, at least for the case of Germany, so this is the first time I can see that we actually achieved the 2045 emission neutrality target because the building sector, we really need to get de decarbonized, get rid of gas. We have a lot of gas there. 50% of households have gas boilers. I think we're going to do that now. I didn't think it two months ago or three months ago. I think we're going to do it now. Um, and, and there are other sectors I'm more concerned about Eastern Europe and the social follow, to be honest. Um, but it's going to be very tough also in the winter. But it's also a huge opportunity for the EU and EU integration. It's a huge challenge. So thinking of gas gasketty and sharing the gas across the EU and then within the EU, within each country, with between industry and households, and then between those. I mean, if, if we get a full embargo, actually, this is going to be a terrible crisis politically, but it's also a big opportunity to get through this and to strengthen cohesion. So I hope we take the, the latter route. Thank you, Christian. Whoever wasn't passionate about uh, climate energy policy in Europe uh, before this event will hopefully be passionate about it now. So thank you very, very much in the audience, uh, here in the room, online. Thank you to our fantastic panelists and for making this such a lively exchange. Obviously, I would also like to thank our Civica partner universities across Europe uh, for their collaboration. And uh, I was asked to end with a little bit um, of a pitch. So all of you may want to consider following Civica on Twitter. You may also want to check the Civica website, which is on www.civica EU. And there you will find uh, more information on upcoming events and on all the other activities of the network. So stay tuned, enjoy the next Civica public lecture, which will then be hosted by our Swedish friends at the Stockholm School of Economics. It will be on the 24th of May. And that will be an occasion to talk about food systems, agriculture and sustainability. And I'm sure that many of the issues we discussed um, today will come up in that context um, as well. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, for those in the room, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation um, over a little bite to eat. Thank you very much. <laughs>